and welcome to the panel on high concepts. I'm delighted to welcome four great authors whose combined works have given us and continue to give us great reading pleasure. We have Linwood Barclay, who's joining us from Toronto in Canada, whose latest book is Find You First. Ruth Ware, whose most recent book is One by One. Dorothy Kunsun, whose most recent novel is All My Lies Are True. Her new novel that is due to be published later on this year is I Know, you, I know What You've Done. And Leslie Cara, whose latest novel, The Dare, has just been published. So welcome to all the authors. Um, before I go any further, just to let you know that all the books of the authors will be um, can be bought from Waterstones and they'll be 30% off. So please, please do buy books. Can I just start with Dorothy? And please do chime in everybody. <laughs> and my first question is, um, when you think of high concepts, the phrase high concepts, I think we're looking at the premise of the story and not what happens. Am I right? And how do you, as an author, see this phrase? Um, high concept, it sounds really kind of like highfalutin, doesn't it? It sounds like I, um, I'm writing literary novels and um, I'm not really. And I love writing commercial books and I'm not going to pretend I don't. I love a book that you can just sit there and whiz your way through. I love literary books. I love all sorts of books. But um, I think of it as something that is really thought out, that you kind of have the idea and you really want it to work in the sense of, you want it to work from all angles so that as a writer, you enjoy writing it, but also as a reader, you absolutely love the idea of the story and what happens to it, happens in it and the characters as well as the plot. And that's what I think of when I think of as high concepts. Linwood, what's about you? I think a high concept, I've, and sometimes I, it's not until I tell my idea to my agent, she, stood, she tells me that's high concept. So I didn't know at first that's what it was. But I, for me, a high concept idea, I guess, is one that, you, you know, you feel that kind of everything has been done and it's hard to come up with something new. But if you come up with an idea that is in some way kind of unique, that it's something that hasn't really quite been done before, or at least not that way, that gets your attention, that it's the kind of an idea that you can usually sum up very quickly, and tell somebody what it is, and they go, "Whoa, that's like that's that's I, that immediately engages me. I instantly get a sense of what it's about. Mm -hmm. There's something about it that is that is different or unique, or that that strikes a kind of chord. And and so, and it's usually I, I'm I'm kind of unconsciously always looking for a kind of a high concept idea. I want to think of something that's, whoa, that's different you know and I mean like you know one of your other folks who's involved in this like Adrian McKinty's like when he did the chain I thought that's a story that I don't think has never been done like it was so different and that was so obviously to me high concept mm -hmm. but a lot of stories that are just you know someone gets murdered and somebody comes in and tries to find out who it was and they go around and talk to everybody that can be a very interesting engaging kind of story but it's not high concept I I think it's trying to find something sometimes it also involves tapping into something that's new in the world, like some sort of a new technology or a new ability to do something. Like when I, I did a book a few years ago called Trust Your Eyes that was kind of an updated weird window where someone thought they saw a murder on Google Street View. And they thought that's high concept because that's that's a story you couldn't have done 10 years earlier. Definitely not. I mean, Ruth, how do you feel about it as well when you come to like, are trying to think of um, a storyline for your book. Does the you know does high concept actually come into your thought process immediately, or is it something that comes somewhere long later on down the line? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, no, I don't think I think about my books in those terms when I'm sort of starting out writing. Um, but I think for me, the test of like a high concept idea, which applies more to other people's work, but I think as a writer when someone tells you what their book is about and you think oh I wish I'd got to that first I think that's a really good kind of test of a high concept idea because it's something exactly as Linwood was saying something that's kind of pithy and can be summed up really quickly and you know when a high concept idea is good because you think that's great and I wish I'd done it um, and I didn't 
probably my most high concept book is my first one in a dark dark wood which is murder on a hen night which is a book that can be summed up in you know in one line it tells does what it says on the tin um and I guess I I, I didn't when I started writing about it I wasn't thinking about it in those kind of terms I wasn't thinking about how it'd be marketed or anything but I knew that I was writing a book that I didn't think anyone had done before and that I was worried someone would get there before me and I think that's a real drive as a writer when you know you've got a really good concept and you get that oh god I need to get this down on paper because I will be gutted if someone writes this book first. Oh, Cara, how do you feel about it then? Cara. Very no, sorry. sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I do apologise. I thought you said Carol for a minute. I thought, okay. who, I thought who's Carol? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, as, as the others have said, an idea that's very easily communicated and that has the widest possible appeal, you know, a commercial novel. Um, I was thinking about this, you know, does a novel with does a high concept novel, is it the same as a novel with a good hook? Can you have a good hook that isn't necessarily high concept? And I think you can. Um, I mean, you mentioned the the chain, didn't you, um, Linwood? I think that's a brilliant example of a high concept novel because it, it taps into our, one of those primal emotions. And I think a lot of high concept novels do that. You know, the fear of, you know, your child being kidnapped. It's every parent's nightmare. What wouldn't you do to, to save your child? And I think it's it's a sort of an, a, an idea that grabs people immediately and they think, oh, my God, what would I do in that situation? So, you know, I, I, I mean, with my first novel, which is probably my most high concept, I suppose, The Rumour, I think the title itself does a lot of work mm -hmm. because and I think that often they do in the, these sorts of novels. The title's so important because we all know what a rumour is. We all know how easily they spread and we all know how dangerous they can be and how they can affect innocent people. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? And that we're all trying to come up with one, but I don't think I actively think, oh, I must write a high concept novel. I just, yeah. an idea will come to me and that's what I want to write about. And if I can make it high concept, great, but I don't set out to write one. Um, going back to Ruth again, when we talk about high concept, do you actually think it's fair um, on authors, especially genre fiction writers who are more commercial that, people are expecting something like a high concept novel. I mean, because literary fiction is kind of like seems totally different to genre fiction, which is a lot more commercial. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely there's much more pressure um, to come up with a really killer concept or a killer hook, um, as Leslie was saying. Um, I mean, of course, the great joy of having written a high concept novel is that when you get that first question at literary events of what is your novel about, you have an answer. You know, I used to work in, in books and I used to work with a lot of literary novels and the ones that were the hardest to kind of to pitch to other people were the ones where you just had to say, it's just really well written. Like, it's not really about anything. It's just <laughs> really well written. And you can't, you know, it's very difficult to persuade someone to pick up a book by saying it's really well written. Whereas, you know, if you have a killer hook, then, you know, it, you can say, you know, my book's about a murder on a cruise and people will either respond to that or they won't. Or, you know, as with Steve Kavanagh's novel, you know, it's a book where the killer is on the jury, like job done. You know, you're going to love that. You know, it's your cup of tea. Um, so, yeah, I do. I guess there are things that I feel jealous about in terms of I think sometimes the bar for genre writers is much higher in terms of the pressure on the idea and the, the pressure on the hook um, but once you've done it you make your life easier for yourself in so many other ways that I feel it's a fair exchange. <laughs> Dorothy what about you? Um, yeah I, I, but I think with people think genre fiction commercial fiction is really easy that's the thing you know they don't think that you have to spend a lot of time trying to come up with the idea, but also making it good and people people don't want to put it down. It, they kind of think because it's it's not like lots of flowery language that you're not actually working really, really, really hard to make it a good book. So um, I think there's a fair exchange, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's 
writing a book is hard. I always say this, writing a book is hard. People don't, and you know, when people kind of dismiss a book because of this, this and this, I was like, yeah, I haven't actually written a book, have you? Because it's really, really <laughs> hard. It's one of the hardest things to do. So yeah, I think, I think we kind of, there's a trade-off, yeah. But I mean, I love writing commercial books and I'm sure if I had to write a literary book, I would be, I'd find it just as difficult, but I'd probably sat there thinking, that's really, they've got a really easy job. You know, they just have to sit there and write a few words and, and have a big twist at the end and a twist in the <laughs> middle and have characters people care about and have a good hook. So yeah, I think, yeah, fair exchange. I think it's kind of, it's almost apples and oranges, but also it's oranges at Jaffa's and, and Satsumas. It's kind of the same thing. <laughs> hard to do. Libra, do you think it's a fair exchange? Well, I, I you know, I, I was, I was really intrigued by something that Ruth had said, which was this sort of sense of immense anxiety. When you come up with a high concept, you think, oh my God, why has no one else thought of this? And I felt that way when I wrote Trust Your Eyes. I felt that way with, I, well, there was another one of mine, I thought, oh my God, someone else is going to do this. And, and so you, you write as fast as you can, but you can't get your publishers to put it out the next week, which is unfortunate. Um, I think a year ago, I had an idea that I was thinking of, and then it was, and then Harlan Colvin came out with a book that was, that used that idea and the same thing happened to me with Joe Finder. So I will never forgive them. Um, <laughs> but I think um, to your point, I'm not sure I know what you mean about fair exchange, but I think that, um, but I certainly agree with Dorothy that uh, this, this is this is not as easy as some people might think it looks um, to try to come up. And the other thing about a killer a hook is, is it's great if it's really a high concept and it's an amazing idea, but it also has to at some level be believable. It can't just be, oh, wow, this is so out there that people will think, well, yeah, it's out there, but it also could just never happen. If the trick is to find that balance of an idea that's high concept, that's really intriguing, but it, it could happen. You know, just the right set of circumstances and so forth. It's believable, which you know, I which I think is the can be the struggle um, is finding that, and that's and and these are people who can you know on the screen here who can pull that off. Well, this brings me to a, a question that I was going to ask like later, but I'll ask it now and address it, uh, Leslie. As you all write all write standalone novels, um, does the concept of having to think of a high concept put added pressure on you? Um, do you know, I don't, I, I would, a few years ago, I would have said no, because I was, you know, uh, very new to the industry then. And um, I didn't quite realise I'd be expected to write a novel every year, <laughs> which is quite something, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I think, I think it does actually put some, put some pressure on you. Yeah, I do. I do feel, I, I, yeah, coming up with a different idea. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. So repeat the sorry. Just repeat the question because I've gone a little bit off. off I, I, was, I was saying, as you all write standalone novels, does the concept of having to think of a high concept put added pressure on you? Yeah, I think I think it does because I think there are some such great ideas out there, and you know, even the people's attention spans are so short now, aren't they? With social media and everything, sort of, you know, that if people aren't grabbed immediately, they'll put the book down. So I do think there is. <clears throat> There is that pressure on you, definitely. Yeah, I, 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 I do feel it, but I'm, I'm not going to let that um, put me off writing what I want to write because I think if you try and sort of shoehorn yourself into a particular concept simply because that's what you think is going to be, you know, profitable, I think that's a, that's the wrong wrong way. You have to write what you want to write, and uh, so far I've been lucky for my first three novels and the one I'm writing now. The ideas have just sort of arrived you know I've been triggered by something you know with with, with the dare my current one it was sort of um, a childhood walk that I used to go on that involved a train crossing and I, I just imagined what would happen if, if you know someone had been killed on the on the crossing and how that would affect you as a, as a child so I, I've been lucky with ideas so far at the moment I'm struggling to come up with the next one so I'm hoping that over the summer something will something will happen <laughs> but of course we're all locked down so we're not getting those experiences that we normally get which uh, I, I, I'm missing I think so. Dorothy do you have that same view? Um, 
you know, I, I wrote my first sequel, my, uh, All My Lives Are True is the sequel to The Ice Cream Girls. And before I would have said, yes, it's real pressure, but trying to write a sequel to a book that everybody loved is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying this and people think I've, I'm probably sat here going, oh, my life is so hard. I'm not at all. I love what I do. And I, I feel very fortunate to be a writer. But yeah, when you're having to kind of carry on the characters and create them, um, create them and keep them realistic, but also find a unique story for them to carry it on. I swear, the next book, um, I know what you've done, it was a breeze because I didn't have to, I didn't have the pressure of finding, you, you know, can. things that they might have done or might not have done. So um, I've kind of learned my lesson, I suppose. Yeah, so I don't find it difficult, but I'm always thinking of new things and new ideas and new book ideas. So I, I find that quite easy to come up with ideas. It's the actual sitting down and doing it that kind of you get the difficult part coming through. So I don't feel pressured in that way, no. Ruth, do you feel pressured? I mean, I definitely, I do sometimes feel jealous of series fiction writers, not so much because of the high concept thing, because actually I think there's probably equal pressure on series writers. Um, you know, I think, can think of several really high concept novels that are part of a recurring character series. So I don't think it lets you off the hook <laughs> um, if, if you have a, a recurring <laughs> character. Um, but I definitely, I think there is a real pressure in terms of, you know, coming up with a, a whole new plot and a whole new world and a whole new set of characters every single time. It is a little bit like being asked to invent the wheel again and again and again. And there's, you know, there's only so many ways you can, you can tell a story. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, it's an enormous freedom because I, you know, I could well imagine being it with, a series character having a great idea that just didn't work for that character. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the choice of, do you break with your contract? Do you maybe disappoint your readers who are desperate for the next, you know, whatever your character is? Um, I don't know. Do you think Ian Rankin wakes up in the middle of the night and <laughs> write the chain and things, but that's not a Rebus novel. <laughs> maybe he does. <laughs> Well, what about you? <laughs> well, I've actually had that conversation with Ian because Ian says, and we've been on stage together, and he's talking about you come up with the high concepts. And, and I think that that's true. I don't think that Ian does high concepts, but he doesn't need to. And because, you know, if you are doing a series, people are coming back to it because they want to spend time with those characters. So the need for a high concept is much less. Because, you know, like I've been a fan forever of the, the Spencer novels by Robert B. Parker and those that are now being written by Ace Atkins. And, and I come back because I love these characters and how they interact and the banter and so forth. So in those cases, I don't think that you need that high concept to the same degree. For, the, for those of us doing standalones, I mean, as Ruth said, I mean, that's just one of the pressures. There's, you know, like there's a whole list of them. Um, I always feel like that for me, you know, you every time you sit down to do another book, uh, you, you want it to be better than all the ones that came before it. You want it to be the best one that you'll ever do. And I think sometimes that's why we keep writing book after book, because we're still searching for that absolutely perfect book, which is so elusive. And but and sometimes, you know, I think, well, I, I think I did it. I pulled it off. This is the best one I've ever done. And then other times I think, well, it'll get me by. And, uh, you know, but so. But there are, but as Ruth said, there's there's also a lot of freedom because when you're writing a standalone high concept book, you can do whatever you want to these people. They not coming back, and so you have your way with them. Do whatever you want, and so there's also a kind of a, a liber, liberating sort of feeling about doing a standalone that way. So, you know, for the last what eighteen months, possibly or slightly over a year, we've all been in lockdown for the pandemic, and normally when authors are thinking of things to inspire them. It's either something they've seen when they've gone on a walk or, or I've read something in the newspapers. Um, how easy was it for you to, how easy was it for you to think up unique ideas and, 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 or a hook in general this, within the last one year, bearing in mind the fact that, you know, everybody's writing, the way they've been writing has just completely changed. And I'm, Anybody can start. <laughs> well, I was writing um, 
the dare I was doing the edits, uh, which involved kind of a major rewrite of the second half during lockdown one. And I found that incredibly difficult, actually. I was really, really struggling. I don't know why. I think it was just, <clears throat> I think it happened to a lot of people, didn't it? A lot of people just lost their reading mojo and their writing mojo. And I was thinking, you know, I've got all this time to write. I should be able to, to, to write two novels at least. But uh, no, it was, it was a real struggle. But um, I, think, I think after the sort of that initial fear and worry had sort of eased off a bit and I'd sort of got used to it. It didn't ease off, but you know, we, we kind of acclimatized to it. Um, I got stuck into it um, and I'd already had the idea for my current work in progress. So that was sort of ticking away at the back of my mind. So it wasn't too much of a problem for me. <laughs> Yeah, I actually had my idea for I Know What You've Done, um, lying in bed, feeling sorry for myself because I wasn't feeling very well. I didn't have the virus, the virus, but I wasn't, feeling, I wasn't feeling well. So I was lying in bed, feeling sorry for myself. And I looked out the window and I thought, what if I'd seen something that happened um, in, from my bedroom window? A bit like rear window, but not in the sense of it ends up with uh, a woman discovers that all her neighbours have been... Um, one of her neighbours has been spying on all the other neighbours keeping a diary of all their secrets. Yeah. So that actually came from being at home and locked down because I was sitting there um, looking out and that became a book. It wasn't about lockdown, which, um, but it's a kind of a post lockdown world. So we, it, it's kind of mentioned. So for me, I got my idea from the fact we were at home. And, um, but I, I often get ideas from like reading newspapers or a news story or I mean I did get a lot of them from eavesdropping I can't pretend I didn't so following people around the supermarket listening to their telephone conversations going oh I wonder what how that turns out and I could make that into a story from this this and this but um for me it wasn't difficult to get an idea and my second I've got my idea for the next book it's not um it's uh, it's been fine for me getting ideas writing has been kind of up and down and and it actually got worse as lockdown went on I thought I was fine at the beginning but and I was doing all these great things and then suddenly I was like oh I've got to finish this book and I've got to finish this book and oh yeah I still haven't finished that book <laughs> so that's what sort of as it got longer and longer and usually I mean it's the first time I've not ever hit my deadline I always hit my deadline and this time was the first time I <laughs> kind of my deadline kind of got extended and then extended and then extended because it was just really difficult to sit down and write. So the ideas were there, but the actual wasn't as much. Leanwood. Yeah, I, I mean, I've worked from home since 1993 when I started doing writing a column for the Toronto Star and I, I could do work from home. So, I mean, the pandemic didn't affect my, my writing routine in the sense that I've always been at home to works for a long time. Um, and when it first, when, when the pandemics began, of course, and let me just add that here in Toronto, we just started another month long lockdown yesterday. Oh, wow. So it's just as well that my editing notes have just arrived and I've got work to do for the next few weeks. But I think I, it, I've, I've heard from a lot of people that they found lockdown hard for working. For, I think that working was probably the blessing for me during the lockdown because it gave me something to throw myself into. And, and, I, and I had the novel that I delivered in January of this year, I wrote, you know, I worked on that from September to Christmas and I had something to do, which was, which was a good thing. I think it's been tougher for me when I haven't had work through that. I had my stuff done, everything off my plate. And then it was just kind of, what are we gonna do? As far as ideas coming to me, that hasn't been a problem. Cause first of all, I had two or three ideas kind of that had been in my back pocket for a couple of years. And so I pulled that, pulled one of those out to do when I started in September. And uh, I think the question a lot of us face and get asked is, are we going to now write about the pandemic? And, or how will it, how will it affect what we write in the future? I mean, even when it's over, will we reference it? Cause it's a world event. It's like, like a, you know, like a world war or something. So, I mean, in the book I've written for next year, there's references, you know, the guy's got old masks that are under the car seat or whatever. And, and so we know that it happened, but as far as writing a, a sort of pandemic epic, 
I don't know how many of us are interested in reading that, at least not this soon. And there was a guy named Stephen King who wrote one back around 1980 called The Stand, which is was not a bad book. So, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't see jumping into writing a pandemic novel. I just think it, it, I'll recognize that it occurred, probably. I, I mean, um, <clears throat> May wrote a, 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 a kind of like a, a pandemic book back in, I think it was, was it 2004? And the, I understand that his publishers um, weren't interested in it, but it got resurrected literally um, just as the pandemic was starting because they suddenly realized, oh, actually this is a good book now. And it, it sold loads and loads and loads. So, you know, it's very interesting. Ruth, w would you actually write about the pandemic? Um, yeah, I don't know. My husband is a virologist, so he's been going on at me for years to do a pandemic novel. And <laughs> in virology circles, you know, they've been talking about the next big flu was due. You know, typically you have a really bad pandemic every 50 years. We had one in 1918. We had one in 1968. Um and yeah, so it, it it's it's been like due any time now for a while. Um, and I was always like, oh, I don't know. I don't think anybody wants to read this. And now I feel even more that nobody wants to read this. Um, but when it was all just kind of, it was all just starting and there was like rumours over in China and things weren't going great. Um, I listened to the Wall Street Journal's podcast um, and there was this fascinating um interview with two journalists who had been I think they were like one of the last journalists out of or one of the last western journalists out of Wuhan and they'd taken the last train out of Wuhan and they'd got stuck halfway across the country mm. as areas were kind of locking down mm. and they were in this hotel where they were being kind of forcibly quarantined no one would talk to them they were stuck in their room wearing masks the staff would, were really scared so they would kind of come leave a cart of food and then literally like run away and part of me was kind of thinking what an amazing setting for a novel you know you have a really disparate group of people who've just sort of washed up at this hotel and are trapped here can't get away um and then it just everything just hit the fan and it all became deeply too real um I was editing uh one by one at the time uh, which is a super claustrophobic novel in uh, the characters are trapped in a ski chalet by an avalanche so that was a weird experience to be editing that in my own sort of lockdown hell um and then my kids, I have school age kids, uh, suddenly they were at home. So although like Linwood, I've worked from home for years and I am super comfortable, like my life revolves around a little <laughs> triangle between, you know, the supermarket, my desk and my kids' school gates. That's it. I don't I don't go anywhere else. So I, I, you know, the world didn't change for me in one sense, but in another sense, like suddenly my family was home 24 <laughs> seven and I wasn't getting any work done everybody wanted snacks all the time my kids are really too young to to homeschool themselves you know they needed someone standing over them explaining things showing them how to work with tech or whatever so I just had like I finished edits um I did a short story that I've been contracted and then I basically just completely ground to a halt and I only started writing again when my kids went back into physical school last September um, and then, of course, as people here in the UK will know, that all stopped at Christmas again. So, so yeah, it's been a real kind of stop start year for me. Um, the book that I'm writing at the moment does not feature the pandemic. I've made a sort of decision to put it into a, a period that could be pre pandemic or could be post pandemic. <laughs> it's sort of not specified yeah. um, and it doesn't really feature anyway. So that's fine. Um, but yeah, like like Linwood was saying, you know, as writers, we have to make a decision like, are you going to tackle this? Are you going to acknowledge it? Is it going to be a feature of the plot? But I think the difficulty for all of us in doing that has been publishing such a slow process. You know, when you write a book, it won't see the light of day for probably at least a year, maybe more. Yeah. And it's very hard right now to know how stuff is going to be panning out in 12 months you know are we going to be living in a post-pandemic world where we're all looking back and going well 2021 was a weird year wasn't it or you know uh, 
is some vaccine escape variant going to have reared its head? We'll be back to square one. Everyone will be in despair. You know, how do you write for a world that you can't predict? So, yeah. So at the moment I'm taking the I went back at the beginning of um, when all this started. I went back and read loads of Agatha Christie's as kind of comfort reading. Um, and she wrote 12 books during World War Two and not one of them references the war even in passing like sometimes characters what? are away occasionally but you don't really it's never specified why and I thought yeah I think for my own sanity I'm gonna have to take that tack so that's what I've done so far <laughs> um, um, Leslie would you consider well yeah I did consider it in fact my current um, novel book four that I'm just about to start on the edits I it, it finishes it starts in um, October 2019 and finishes in March 2020 so I figured that was safe because by the time that comes out whatever is happening in the world what happened then we'll know won't we so I, I you know I, I felt fairly safe doing that I had intended to set the whole thing in the current time in 20 as, when I was writing it and I didn't want to write about the pandemic, but I wanted to have, as Lyndon was saying, uh, Linwood, sorry, was saying um, tangential references, you know, maybe a discarded mask here or something like that. Um, but actually the plot just didn't work because it, the, the current novel involves a, a woman whose aunt's just been murdered in the flat upstairs and a funeral director is visiting the house to arrange the funeral. And I just thought, it wouldn't happen. Everything would have to be done over the phone and that wouldn't make terribly great fiction. You know? yeah. so I thought this isn't this isn't going to work. So now I've got it where it ends just as the country is going into lockdown. And I felt sort of confident that that might work at least, you know. All right. Well, as authors, how, how do you write? And do you just come up with some sort of plan or do you just sit down and write? And does this have an effect on the whole nature of having to sometimes think of a high concept thing for your novel. Dorothy. Um, see, I, I, with every novel, I forget what I did the previous year because it's so, <laughs> so chaotic. I did the thing the other night um, with a couple of other writers who were all like, oh yes, we sit down at 10 o'clock and I write till one o'clock and then I have lunch and then sometimes I come, and I look at them going, wow, really? <laughs> You know, because I'm just like all over the place. I just, you know, I have so many other things I need to do in a day that it often ends up with me sitting down at 10 o'clock at night and going, all right, I need to do some writing now. And then I write till two o'clock and then go to sleep for a couple of hours and then wake up and then carry on. And that's towards the end of the book when I, I look great. You know, my husband looks at me and goes, I love you. I know why I love you. Because I look great. Um, but I... I do a lot of research. So I have the idea that I'll do a lot of research as well as writing. And the other thing I don't do is I don't write in order. I don't plot in order. I don't yeah. write in order. So I will write the middle first. Sometimes I write the end first. Um, and then I'll come back and write, completely rewrite the whole thing, put it all together and rewrite the whole thing. Um, and that horrifies a lot of writers. I can see all your faces going, what? <laughs> he does what? But um, I do that. So. I don't get stuck on a certain part of the book. So I, um, so whilst I'm doing that, I'm writing the scenes that come into my head, I'm also researching and talking to people and interviewing people because a lot of my books, I do talk to a lot of people about or do a lot of reading around so, um, so that I'm, I can be authentic about what I'm writing about. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm, basically chaos until I've done the book and then I kind of send it off so <laughs> Linwood tell me you're not like that <laughs> I am not like that um, <laughs> but listen hey whatever works you know what I mean whatever yeah exactly uh, for me I I mean for me it's kind of the high concept that comes first I'm kind of waiting for you know there's some great idea floating in the ether and once it lands then once I have an idea that I think could sustain another no a whole novel I'll sit down maybe for a couple of weeks and I'll just make notes in a book, just kind of fleshing out the idea. And, but then I get bored doing that. I think oh, I'm just gonna write the damn thing. So I start writing, but when I start writing, I generally know the big picture. I know, I know my starting point. I know where I'm gonna end up. I know who's done what. I just don't know what opportunities exist in the book until I get going. So once I get on, I mean, I sort of, if, I, if I'm traveling, I'm sort of starting here and I'm gonna end up here. And I know I'm gonna end up here 
but this root could be kind of you know like this up and down and, and so i know where i'm going but i i i can't plan out ahead of time what i call the big mushy middle and um but but the big picture i have in my head i usually know what the ending what's going to happen at the end sometimes it changes but but i i just i can i mean and and work for me like it's very much just it's like going to work because when you spend, I spent 30 years working in newspapers. And, and so writing is a job and you get up in the morning and you go to work and you do it. And so that's kind of the way I've operated when I'm doing a book. Now, um, I'm gonna start dealing with some questions. We've got quite a number of questions in the Q and A. And I think I'll go with the first one. So it's from Louise Fairburn and she's, her question is, do you feel character development comes second to plot in high concept novels? And that she says, I often enjoy reading them, but rarely want to reread them. And I think it's because I don't engage with the characters as much as I do in a series. Yes. I think character development, I think in a high concept novel, premise does come first. It has to come first, but having said that, premise isn't enough. The high concept idea on its own is not enough. It has to have nuanced storytelling and um, a relatable character, otherwise it's not going to work. So the answer to that is tricky, isn't it? Yes, the premise comes first, you've got to have the good idea, but unless you've got all the other things to go with it and, and have, because people have got to care, haven't they? You know, they've got to care about that character and, and identify with them and empathize with them and want them to succeed. Um, so yeah, I, I think premise first, but character development is still very, very important. It, whatever genre you write, because people have got to care about the characters. I think as well, people quite often ask, like, which comes first, plot or character? And for me, I can't really answer that because in a way, plot is character. Like, the if you want something to happen, you have to try and figure out what kind of person would do that, you know. Uh, and likewise, if you, you know, crime is such a, motivation is such a central thing to crime you know it's all about why would someone do that what kind of person would they have to be how you know what made them like that um so I think in it's not plot or character the two are so inextricably linked but it's definitely true that in standalone novels you know you have to introduce a large number of characters relatively quickly and you've only got one book to get to know them so it doesn't have that pleasure that series fiction sometimes does where you're constantly you know it's like someone that you've known for 30 years you find out new things about them you find out surprising stuff about their childhood that you never knew and a little bit more of them makes sense so yeah you have to kind of cram it into a shorter space I guess all of that character development. I think part of the not being able to read it again could be the fact that you know what's coming because you know it's hard to watch um, for example the one, the Stephen King story where the guy's in the prison. I can't remember what it's called now. Shawshank? Yeah. Sorry? Shawshank? Shawshank, yeah. You can't watch that because you know what's coming. So it's, it's you can watch it again for the pleasure of it, but you do know. Yeah. So when you're reading a, a high concept novel with lots of twists, you kind of know when the twists are coming. So if you put it aside for a few years and you don't, um, you don't remember what's coming, you kind of, you can enjoy it again. But I think... I can't think of a book I've read, a standalone book I've read that I haven't actually had some sort of engagement with the character and I don't want to know what happens to them. You know, I don't necessarily actually, I don't actually read that many series books. So I actually quite in like getting to know different people, having a one night stand as it were with all these different characters in these books. <laughs> um, and not having a, a long-term relationship with them. So yeah, so for me, as, as we've said, it is both. Like they don't, they can't be, you know, separated. They do come together, plot and character are kind of inextricably, inextricably linked, I spot for me. Ian, yeah, well, do you feel the same? Well, I think there's, I mean, for me, the what if is the, th is the first thing that comes. Like some people have a sense of a character when they start to write a book. And I, for me, it's always the what if, which is what if this happened and that, so that's plot. And once I get into a book, I find that character 
is something that I don't consciously spend a lot of time thinking about. I have a kind of instant sense of who my characters are and, and, and how they're going to work and how they're going to bounce off each other. But, but I think there's no reason why a great high concept thriller can't also be, have fabulous characters. And the, and the book I would always mention is I Am Pilgrim by Terry Hayes, yeah. which is, um, is probably the best thriller I've read the last 10 years for sure. And it's a high concept, it's a fantastic idea. And the characters are so rich, particularly the character of the terrorist is so well put together that it's a, it's a masterpiece. So there's no reason why, you know, I mean, you can, have, you can have literary novels that are great on character that have such a boring plot, you can't get through it. So it's, you know, all books are kind of the same. Do they work or do they not work? Do they have an interesting story and do they have good characters? And, the, and, what, and when you can bring all of that together, you know, you've got yourself a pretty decent read. Right, Ooh, we've got a question from Ian Rankin. This is interesting. <laughs> and Ian says, oops, those of us who write series characters are often envious of the freedom given to those who write standalones. Is there anything writers of high concept standalones envy about series writers? Oh, loads. Loads. <laughs> <laughs> I'm incredibly envious of series writers. I'd love to be able to write a series, but it doesn't kind of go, I don't know, are there any psychological suspense series? I'm not sure. Um, it's, it's, it's harder to do, isn't it, in the, in the sort of subgenre that... Uh, that we write in. Um, uh, yeah, no, I'm very envious because you've got that ready-made character, haven't you? And the backstory and all those little threads and things that you can develop. And although each novel in a series, it has got to be, you know, complete in itself and someone's got to be able to read it without necessarily having read the other books in the series, you know, you, you can leave a little sort of threads that you can pick up in a following novel. So I think that would be great. I'm dead envious. I'd love to be able to think of a good idea for a series. <laughs> I would have to say with where Ian's concerned, and mostly I'm just jealous of his rugged handsomeness. <laughs> <laughs> That's going on his next book, Linwood. He's gonna be, <laughs> I'm jealous of Ian's rugged handsomeness. <laughs> little features are hard to compete with. You're, you're ruggedly handsome too, Linwood. Oh, exactly. Not whatever. It's just... <laughs> I'm part... massively envious of anyone who can write series. I would love to think of a series character, but I'm not. I, I'm too lazy to do the research into all the police side of things. So, and it's very difficult now. You can't have kind of, you know, amateur detectives rocking up and sort of saying, "Do you mind if I have a poke around your crime scene, old fellow?" And you know, they're all like, "Well, of course, you're Lord Peter Wimsey." So. <laughs> So, like it's just not so yeah so it's that thing of how do you find someone who can plausibly be involved in lots of crimes mm. unless you know you can go the carolyn kepnis route and make your main character the killer um but i haven't i haven't done that yet but no like leslie i would <clears throat> i would love to find uh partly because i just love my characters and i i occasionally think about them and wonder how they're getting on you know i have characters from five books back that I still think about and I still you know I'd love to sit down with them and find out how their lives are going but I suspect the answer might be quite boringly because the one extraordinary thing that happened to them in their life was that book. <laughs> that was one of the things with um with my books I used to always say I don't do sequels because and then you my, did. well yes I did but I, I, I put my characters through so much it's kind of not fair really to drag them through it again until they're a ice cream girl and then that was but one of the good things about the Ice Cream Girls sequel was I got to go back and fix all the bits that I kind of <laughs> a couple of years later realised that I should have done. So I had the chance to go back and go, actually, do you know what? That bit, I should have kind of fleshed that out. I should have explained about that um, as well as moving their story on. So that's one of the things I envy. You can go, you can fix things. You can, you can make a mistake and you can find a way to fix it in the next thing. You can explain it away. So but you know when the opposite way around as well. Like if you if you make something happen in book one, you can't then contradict that in book five because it's better for the plot. So you're I'm kind sure of... there's a way you can. <laughs> you know, that's the thing about making things up. You can make it up. You know, he's got a twin. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's all a dream. <laughs> it's all a dream. Yeah. <laughs> So I, Bobby I, I, can, I can say as a twin, that doesn't always work. I'm telling you that now. <laughs> I've never written a twin. I think I'm practically the only crime writer who's never written a twin. So 
<laughs> I've written about twins. The tw um, the people in my books generally. Oh no, I do. I scream girls. Her sisters were twins. So yeah, I did. I've done it all. I've done it all. In the seventeen books, I've done it all. I don't know how I'm going to write book eighteen now. I've done it all. Uh, okay. Um, yes. an, uh, another question we've got is from a lady called Michelle Huli Hulihan, and she said, "Did any of you have a published mentor before you were published?" And also, thank you all for helping keeping us entertained, especially over the last last year. Yes. Did I have a published mentor? Yes. If I could, if I could, I have a couple um, actually, but it was it was long before I got published. But um, when I was a writer in re when I was in university, the writer in residence was a well known Canadian literary writer named Margaret Lawrence, who became very good friends. But and even perhaps more notably. Um, Ross McDonald, who wrote the Lou Archer novels, mm -hmm. was a mentor. He, he was someone with whom I corresponded a lot when I was in my late teens and 20s, early 20s, and had spent an evening with him at dinner and so forth. And he, he read early works of mine and, and critiqued it and so forth. And while those were never published, and we can all be grateful for that, um, uh, it was nice that someone of his stature would take an interest and see that there was there was something there. It would be a long time after that before I was published, but but he was definitely a mentor. Ruth? Um, no, I was extraordinarily secretive about my writing, yeah. um, partly because I worked in books and it made me incredibly self-conscious. It gave me this, I should know, this enormous sense of inadequacy, I think, because I worked with all of these amazing writers and I just couldn't really imagine ever like living up to the people I was working with um so yeah for years I just wrote and just put the books underneath my bed and it was only really when I had kids that I realized that basically my writing was a hobby and that I didn't have time for hobbies anymore and that unless I found a way to make this pay it wasn't going to stay in my life I, I had to you know do something with it or lose it so that was the point at which I started writing with kind of publication in mind and sent it out to my now agent um so no I never I I don't think I ever admitted to anybody aside from maybe my couple of best friends from school that I was writing um and it took me probably 10 books to even sh let them read it so uh yeah so it was a weird kind of naught to 60 experience having literally like I didn't I didn't even let my husband read my books and mm. and then being like yeah no it's going to be published and anybody can read it was it was a strange feeling yeah Dorothy no I didn't I did do a lot of reading magazines um writing writers news and writing magazine reading as much as I can about authors and um I kind of felt like they were mentoring me because I was reading about their processes and that's why I always advise people who want to be writers now find out as much as you can nowadays it's really easy to like follow them on twitter or you know other social media and read stuff so no I didn't but I did you know when I started my I set my website and I thought at the time back in 1876 the, the, the internet was going to be very important for books so I set it up and then I interviewed a lot of I asked a lot of authors yeah to fill in questions and so I had a lot, quite a lot of interviews with authors on my website and you know people who were very generous with their time like Joanne Harris, Jodie Pico um, other people like that who were really generous with somebody who wasn't published and and I always remember that and I always try and, you know, pay it forward as it were and try and help out people yeah. whenever I can. Obviously, I can't as much as time goes on. It's harder and harder. But I, don't, I didn't have a mentor, but I did have people who were generous with their time. Yeah. Uh, before Leslie answers this question, uh, they, um, for Dorothy, please, there's um, a question from a lady who's asking, are you going to continue? Are you going to go back to do, having the author podcasts? Oh yes, I'm doing them at the moment. I'm just um, interviewing people at the moment and also finding the time to record my talk to the camera, talk to the microphone things. Yeah, so yes, definitely coming back. And I wanted it to come back before now, but as I constantly say, you know, I've got so many things to do. I kind of have to crowbar it into everything else I do. But yes, it's definitely coming back. Okay. Um, Leslie, what about you? Did you have a mentor? 
Yeah, I'm just going to say to Dorothy, I'm very glad it's coming back because I absolutely love The Happy Author. It's a brilliant podcast if anyone Thank hasn't you. heard it. absolutely love it. Um, no, I didn't have a published mentor. Like Ruth, I was quite a secretive writer for many years. Um, it wasn't really until I went, I applied to the Faber Academy I, um, when I was sort of in my 40s and um, I'd been sort of... Um, recuperating at home after a series of operations and I was quite depressed and I thought I was depressed because I really wanted to write and I'd been treating it like a hobby as as Ruth said you know most of my life and actually I should have been prioritizing it and it wasn't until I started prioritizing it that I suddenly felt this is what I'm meant to be doing and so going to the Faber Academy really helped because although it doesn't teach you to write you're meeting other people you're getting a writing tribe you know um and and you know people like Maggie G Richard Skinner who were the tutors on the course they gave invaluable advice and editing advice and we met lots of of, you know agents came to talk to us and editors so that's really what was a turning point for me um but uh, but I also I started my own writing group as well and that that's that's val really invaluable as well you know you don't necessarily have to have a published mentor what you need is feedback you need real readers to, to read your work and not be frightened to put it out there and, and get get opinions on it that's, mm -hmm. that's what helps Yes, um, yes, okay, then um, I'm looking at keeping an eye on the time. We haven't got that long to go, but one of the other questions that's come up is from um, Christopher Zorowski, who runs Bolo Books in America. And he says, is it sometimes easier to do a high concept about everyday people? It seems that police procedurals, PIs and such are more rare in the high concept realm. Linwood? Well, I, I mean, I tend to talk about ordinary people anyway, so that's always kind of my go-to. I think about what if something extraordinary happened to a regular ordinary person, and and so and maybe that adds to the element of high concept because when you're as a reader, it you know you can identify with that situation, thinking, oh my God, what if this happened to me? So I think maybe there's something to that, but you know. It's, it's the game is wide open. You know, anybody can do whatever they want. You can write a police procedural that's high concept. Think of seven, you know, there's a, there's a police procedural. Holy mackerel is that high concept. So I think it just, you know, there's nothing you can't do. I'm just saying for me, I like, I like terrible things happening to regular folks. I just like to make their lives hell. Ruth? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think similarly to what Linwood said, the kind of the rule in writing tends to be either extraordinary things happening to ordinary people or ordinary things happening to extraordinary people and you it tends to go one way or the other um, but yeah absolutely I mean you can definitely have high concept novels um, for people who work in crime you know Steve Kavanagh wrote um, 13 which is um, a part of his long-running series about um, a lawyer um, and that that's as high concept as it as it gets you know it's a, a lawyer a murderer on a jury who's killing off his other jurors um, so it, there's, I don't think there's any kind of hard and fast rule but I think it's certainly easier if you're if you're coming up with a very um, very high concept very unusual situation to have someone extremely remarkable at the center of it maybe just makes the whole thing a bit too much for Phoenix. It's more interesting to say, what if this weird thing happened to just you or me? That's always, that tends to be my instinct. Thank you. Um, Dorothy, one of the questions that was coming is from um, Alex Hawley and he's asked, when does something become no longer high concept, but mainstream? Does it happen? I don't, I don't know there's any difference for me that they're all kind of mainstream and I mean, what is mainstream? Because high concept is the thing that we want people to pick up your book. It's the, it's the, it's the snapshot idea, but it's still something that people, lots of people pick up and lots of people sort of like whiz through. So I don't see the, I don't think there's a difference for me, but I don't know if anyone else believes that, but I don't see there's a difference. Main, high concept, it kind of, distinguishing it from the things that people pick up and read and reread and or just really adore I don't see the difference myself. Leslie do you? No I, d I don't really see the difference I mean I think it's it can be a problematic term really high concept can't it I mean I was thinking it's 
and it can be related to setting and form, which we, we haven't sort of talked about that, because, I mean, I'm thinking of something like, you know, the French lieutenant's woman in terms of that was high, con I know it's not crime, but it's high concept in terms of that sort of, um, you know, the, the different endings and, 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 um, and in terms of settings, you know, Robert Harris's fatherland, you know, what would it be like ordinary people, but in a, a Nazi Britain, you know, those sorts of things as well. Again, with we're going back to the previous question, I suppose there, it, but it's, it's, it's a tricksy term. Term, isn't it high concept I'm, I'm not sure I understand the difference between high concept and mainstream and I'm not even sure whether these labels are terribly helpful so they might sort of constrict us a bit and you know if I could jump in to say high concept doesn't have to be complicated think of something like Jaws shark terrorizes beach you can sum it up in three words and it's, and it's as simple as can be, but I think that's a high concept idea because it's so simple, so simple to communicate and, and so relatable because we all have this kind of fear of heading into the beach. Yeah. Well, um, that very last question, because we've only got around four minutes left. Um, how important therefore is setting? When you're writing? Massive, I, I, setting is one of the things that I start thinking about first and it, my setting is always a character in my novel so I think about it very carefully and oftentimes it's you know as previously established I live a fairly humdrum life going from uh, you know work to the supermarket to school gates uh, it's a chance to get out and get somewhere exciting you know even if it's only in my head. Dorothy? Uh, sorry what was the question again? <laughs> I probably just, <laughs> I'm probably just uh, setting. Oh, I set my books. I, I set my books where where I live. So my a lot of my later books are set in Brighton because I moved to Brighton <laughs> after I came out from Australia. And I made a choice of not setting them in London because the UK is bigger than London. So um, yeah, setting is it is uh, like we've said. It is a character in my books, but it is important. But just as important as character is and plot. So yeah, it's all part of the same thing. It's all part of the writing a book experience. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, I hope that I was, I, I wasn't, he hasn't made you My mind just went blank. I don't know why. I just, just went blank. Sorry. We've had the worst year, Dorothy. It's very bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad I'm not the only one because I had to ask for the question to be repeated in the beginning. <laughs> We've got three minutes left. And I want to ask Linwood specifically about this question because I'm, when I think of your book, The Elevator, I just thought, wow, for a setting that was you know, spot on. Well, ele yeah, elevator pitch was, I mean, most times I think setting is not as important to me because I kind of set them off in a kind of generic suburbs, whatever that everyone's familiar with everybody. I mean, when I wrote some earlier novels that were set in a sort of make-believe suburb, everybody was convinced that they knew it was their suburb. And I heard from all over the place, you know, so, but, but the one book that setting was crucial was elevator pitch because it was a story about a guy who set, kills people by sabotaging elevators. Yeah. And it had to be New York. Like it could only be, it, to me, that was the, you know, it's this most vertical city. It had to be there. So that was the one novel where setting was just absolutely, you know, it'd be very hard to set a novel about a guy who kills people with elevators in the American Plains. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be a challenge. Okay. All right. <laughs> Can I just say, um, as we're going to have to wrap up, to say thank you very, very much indeed. This has been a wonderful panel. And it's, I'm delighted to see everybody and it, thank you indeed. And um, for anybody who's still listening in, um, please, please go and buy their books. They're available from Waterstones with 30% off. And thank you to Leslie, Dorothy, Ruth and Linwood. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.